Good afternoon and welcome to Searching the Scriptures. This is going to be the Sacrifice of Isaac, Part 11. And today's date is November 21st, 2022. And I'll go ahead and read from Judges, excuse me, from Genesis 22, 1 through 18. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of Jehovah called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of Jehovah, it shall be seen. And the angel of Jehovah called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith Jehovah, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. After taking a detour to consider the doctrine of Christ being slain at the foundation of the world, I'd like to read Genesis 30, 25 to 43, and Genesis 31, 1 to 13 again to refresh our memories because the identical word for bound in Genesis 22, 9 appears in seven verses in Genesis 30 and 31 as ring straight. So let's start by going to Genesis 30, 25 to 43.
And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away that I may go unto mine own place, into my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee, and let me go. For thou knowest my service, which I have done thee. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry. For I have learned by experience that Jehovah hath blessed me for thy sake. And he said, Appoint me thy wages, and I will give it. And he said unto him, Thou knowest how I have served thee, and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hadst before I came, and it is now increased unto a multitude. And Jehovah hath blessed thee since my coming. And now when shall I provide for mine own house also? And he said, What shall I give thee? And Jacob said, Thou shalt not give me anything. If thou wilt do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and of such shall be my hire. So shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come, when it shall come for my hire before thy face. Every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep, that shall be counted stolen with me. And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to thy word. And he removed that day the he-goats that were ring-straked and spotted, and all the she-goats that were speckled and spotted, and every one that had some white in it, and all the brown among the sheep, and gave them into the hand of his sons. And he set three days' journey betwixt himself and Jacob, And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and peeled white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters, in the watering troughs, when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle ring-straked, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring-straked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flock by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. And it came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly, and had much cattle, and maidservants, and menservants, and camels, and asses. And now we want to go to the next chapter, chapter 31, and uh, verses uh, 1 to 13. And he heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's. And of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. And Jehovah said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers, and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. And Jacob sent, and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock, and said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not toward me as before. But the God of my father hath been with me, and ye know that with all my power I have served your father. 
And your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckle shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckle. And if he said thus, the ring straked shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straked. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. And it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up mine eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring-straked, speckled, and grizzled. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob. And I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes, and see, all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring-straked, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. This account certainly brings up a number of questions regarding its spiritual meaning. First and foremost, we want to understand how the seven ring-straked cattle verses relate to Isaac being bound in Genesis 22, 9, since they contain the same three Hebrew letters. One way we can approach this is by recognizing that Isaac was bound by Abraham, his father, picturing Christ under the wrath of God the Father at the foundation of the world. Uh, Even as was noted in part 10, when Christ was bound by the Roman soldiers, we're not given any particulars as far as how Abraham went about doing this. Did he use a rope? Did he use strips of leather? Uh, But this actually doesn't really matter we do find a different Hebrew word for bind in Psalm 118.27. And this uh, is an interesting word because it's also in the setting of a sacrifice on the altar, just as we find here in Genesis 22. So let's go to Psalm 118.27. Psalm 118, 27, it says, God is Jehovah, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. And here, this word, as I mentioned, is a different word than what we find in Genesis 22. But the fact that this is taking place on an altar is similar. In fact, the same word for altar as well as horns here in Psalm 118.27 also appear in the Genesis 22 account. If we go to verse 9 of, of Genesis 22, we find the word altar. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And this particular word for altar is Strong's number 4196, and the word for horns is 7161, which we find in verse 13 of Genesis 22. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. We know that the altar 
is a reference to Christ himself, and the horns symbolize power or strength. We still wonder, though, how Isaac being bound in Genesis 22:9 is spiritually related to the sheep and the goats who were ring-straked in Genesis 30 and 31. We do find a clue when Jacob takes the rods of various trees, green poplar, hazel, and chestnut, and he strips off the bark in segments so as to expose the white underneath. Thus, the rods would have the appearance of being striped. Then what he does is he places these rods in the watering troughs so when the sheep and the goats came to the watering troughs, they would drink and they would also mate and they would see the rods. And we, we know God, of course, superintended all of this to ensure that the flocks produce many non-white sheep and goats who are not only stronger genetically, but also very numerous to reward Jacob for his loyal and industrious service to Laban, as he explained to his wives, Rachel and Leah, in Genesis 31, 6 and 7. So let's read that again. Genesis 31, 6 and 7. And ye know that with all my power I have served your father, and your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. Um, it's important also to recognize that, and we don't have time to do a, an, exhaust, an exhaustive study of this uh, whole account here. It's, it's quite complicated. Uh, but we do know that Laban is also a picture of Satan, and so that enters in as well. The striped rods, uh, along with the, the ring straight goats and sheep, uh, gives us a clue as to how God might be associating this account with the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22, but not with these specific Hebrew words. Uh, nonetheless, there are other Greek and Hebrew words that are used in the same way and in the same context that assist us greatly. For example, if we go to Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah 53, 5. And Isaiah 53 is really speaking about the sacrifice of Christ at the foundation of the world. And we read in verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And this word uh, stripes is an important one. Uh, in fact, all of these words, uh, wounded, bruised, chastisement, uh, stripes, all relate to various aspects of the atonement and the penalty for sin, which is death and annihilation. The term wounded can also be rendered as profaned, polluted, and defiled. This is what had to take place uh, to the Lord Jesus because he had become profaned, polluted, and defiled with the sins of all of the elect. Uh, bruised is also translated as crushed, destroyed, broken in pieces, and humbled. Again, this was part of the fact that he was under the wrath of God and he had to die. He had to be annihilated for the sins of the elect. And the idea of chastisement can also appear as doctrine, rebuker, correction, and instruction. And 
uh, in order to provide eternal peace for the elect, to provide eternal salvation for the elect, Christ had to undergo this greatest of all spiritual transactions. We've, uh, I've mentioned from time to time 2 Corinthians 5.21, but it certainly uh, bears repeating because it's such a magnificent verse. For he hath made him to be sin for us, the elect, who knew no sin, that we, the elect, might be made the righteousness of God in him. He takes our sin. He gives us his righteousness. And that is the basis for true biblical salvation. Well, when we think about chastisement, or I should say correction, it's used as correction and instruction we also think about a New Testament passage in 2 Timothy 3.16, which is a very important verse because it's telling us the, uh, some of the purposes of the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration or God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Well, let's take a closer look at this word stripes in Isaiah 53, 5. It's uh, Strong's number 2250. The theological word book number is 598G. And we find it, for example, in Isaiah 1, 5 and 6. So Isaiah 1, 5 and 6. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. And the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified or softened with ointment. And here it's the word and bruises, which is this same word as stripes that we find in Isaiah 53, 5. And notice the other words uh, in this passage, uh, no soundness, wounds, putrefying sores. They have not been bound up. They have not been softened with oil. We can think about the, uh, the man that was uh, left half dead in the parable that the Lord gave where the, the priest comes by, he sees him, he walks away. A Levite comes by, sees him, walks away. Finally, a Samaritan stops, looks at the man, realizes the plight that he's in. He puts him on his donkey. He pours in oil and wine. He bandages him up. He takes him to the inn, and he tells the innkeeper, here's some money. When I return, I'll give you more as far as whatever extra you spend on him. Uh, and of course, that a good Samaritan, a quote-unquote, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as he comes to each of his elect, and where does he find us? He finds us as this man dead or half-dead in trespasses and sins. This is our spiritual condition, and it's only the wine and the oil, the wine representing the blood of Christ, the gospel, and the oil representing the Holy Spirit, that is able to revive this each of God's elect spiritually so that we become a new creature in Christ at some point during our physical lifetime, even though the salvation was secured at the foundation of the world. Let's also uh, go to uh, Psalm 138, uh, verse 5, Psalm 138. 
and in, in verse 5, it's my wounds. And I think I'm going to read the whole song. It's not that long, just eight verses. I will praise thee, uh, excuse me, Psalm 138, a psalm of David. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cried, thou answerest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Jehovah, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of Jehovah, for great is the glory of Jehovah. Though Jehovah be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Jehovah will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Jehovah, endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. We can also go to 1 Peter 2.24 in the New Testament in which we have a reference back to Isaiah 53.5 having to do with the stripes. So 1 Peter 2 and I think I'll read uh, verses 21 to 24. First Peter 2, 21 to 24. Oh, I think it might be hmm. Second Peter. Nope, I must have the wrong, I'm sorry. Um, well, let me just read the passage. Uh, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Uh, actually, it is uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, 21 to 24, that is correct. Um, we also want to bear in mind that Christ is not only the tree of life uh, in the atonement before the foundation of the world and as we learn from Galatians 3.13, cursed is everyone that is hanged on a tree. Now, we recognize that in the demonstration, Christ was physically whipped as some of the New Testament references depict. And we are reminded that his physical sufferings, though very real and extremely painful, serve to emphasize a far greater pain, that of being forsaken by the Father, which is really what is in view in a chapter like Isaiah 53, which when it is studied word by word and phrase by phrase very carefully, underscores the monumental truth that Christ had to die and be annihilated and then rise to life again because he is the firstborn from the dead and he is the very essence of eternal life. 
And of course, all of this transpired before God created this marvelous world and universe that we live in by His Word. Well, I think we'll have to stop here as we've run out of time. Uh, Lord willing, in our next study, we will continue our examination of Genesis 22.